tooth, and a year and a half later, once I've sold everything, I have made all the money back. But that means I need to cr create all of this kind of capital to spend all at once, and then I'll make it back eventually. Like the zine yearbook, it costs four thousand dollars to print it. You know, so that means I need to find four thousand dollars to that I will make back <coughs> eventually, and it does make it back. It just takes a long time to do it, and by the time that I have to pay for the printing of the next yearbook, the sales haven't come in yet. So it's kind of like these big issues, and the way that I've always dealt with it is through my job. You know, now I have like a super corporate job with a salary and benefits and all that kind of stuff. And then that is like, well, I do that because I want to be able to do these projects. You know, and that's the only reason I do that kind of job. And there's a lot of projects that I want to do which don't take advertising and, you know, can't really be sold that well and we have a small number. Like all these projects that are in my head that haven't happened yet. It's like those I'm going to have to pay all of the money for. So that's why, that's how I've always done it. You know, and it's kind of like, I feel like breaking even is your reward for, you know, eight years of hard work. And it's not something you should ever count on happening. It just doesn't. So to me, it's like the priorities aren't financial. I've always told people, if you're in it for the money, you're totally in the wrong scene. You know, like completely. You know, um, but uh, there's some point I wanted to make. <laughs> I'm really absent-minded. No, well, I, okay. I knew what it was. Um, well, just about um, having it, being it like your priorities. Like, if I wanted to make money, I would go about it differently. I'd have more advertising. I'd have a higher cover price. I'd come out regularly, like, more regularly, more often, and things like that. And it's kind of like, you need to decide for yourself what the purpose of your doing the thing or project is, and then figure out how you're going to go about and get the money for it, which is, like, to me, it's something separate from actually doing the project. That's it. I think it's important to <laughs> sort of put a perspective, like when you're asking the question, how do you thrive economically? I mean, I, I wouldn't call what Tree of Knowledge is doing thriving. <coughs> We're not making any money. Mary and I don't make a penny off Tree of Knowledge. We recently were joking around, it was Mary's birthday, and we were like, you know, we work really hard on Tree of Knowledge. We should have this policy where on our birthdays, we go out to have a nice dinner together with money from Tree of Knowledge. And that was like, you know, sort of a joke, but I mean, that, that just sort of frames that, you know, we don't make money. This is something we volunteer our time for. And uh, a few other people volunteer as well. So people are here today helping staff the table or whatever. But I mean, we're not, we're not thriving. We're hanging on. And that, <coughs> it's also important to realize that while that may look sort of impressive with three tables of all this literature and t-shirts and whatever. It's totally insignificant on any kind of a, like a, a market level outside of, you know, like 60 people in a room here. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, in terms of corporate literature distribution, I mean, it doesn't even register on the scale at all. So it's like, I don't know, just important to keep that in perspective. And as far as how have we been able to hang on I guess when I started, I was really frustrated. I'd been doing my own zine for a couple of years, and I was really dis just disgusted. It was kind of like what Scott said about you deal with all these individual small distros on consignment, and never, either never see a penny from them, never hear from them again. They disappear, their address changes. And it's just, you know, you lose a lot of money, and you get burned out, you don't trust anyone. And and I mean, not that money's that big a deal, but it, <laughs> there is an investment for, I mean, you all know there's an investment for you as a zine editor or a, a writer. And, you know, it'd be nice at least to break even. And so often people just, you know, lose all their money or work some shit job to fund this. And, and that's when it really gets frustrating. Is like, I mean, what I did, I, I worked a minimum wage job for two years to start Tree of Knowledge because I was pretty much disgusted with all the other distros I dealt with and thought it'd be great to do a distro that was reliable, paid at least within a month of when, you know, you know, well we do consignment, but we try to pay quarterly within a month, you know, sometimes there's, there's circumstances, but it's, it's just, I don't want people to think that it's a big money making thing and it, it's really not. 
know we've been kind of making jokes in the van on the way up here. We were talking about, yeah, there was this panel discussion about how to thrive as like a independent literature thing, or just in like the underground like media scene or whatever. It's like you're in the wrong business. Like yeah. if you want to thrive, you should so sell right. records. You know, so, yeah, <laughs> really. It's and it's, it gets kind of frustrating too, because like I noticed since I've been helping trade knowledge, it's grown a lot, like leaps and bounds. Like every time we come to something out of town, it's like we add on another table and another table, and you know we think that we're growing and that we're doing good. And it's like we went to a music festival in Detroit in March, and we made a little over two thousand dollars, which was fantastic for us. Well, we sold a little. Like that's in not the, profit. In the yeah, and so yeah, you take in that. Yeah, we got excited and we were like, "Oh, we got all this money," and we put it in the bank. And then the next week, we did payments, and it's all gone. We had yeah. like a couple hundred dollars left, and so it's just you know, it's not really thriving at all. But it is sustaining itself. Yeah. So. <coughs> well, for the last year, I <coughs> have been coming off my film and and maybe supplemented it with some freelance writing work. Um, when I started, I mean, I was in film school, and I was working at a record store, and I wanted to make a movie. Like, all my friends were really into, like, hipster serial killer movies, and I liked the style, but I was kind of sick of how they'd always kill off the women. So I was like, dude, why don't we just kill the men? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this was. And I made it in school. I had no idea that anyone would ever care or be into it. It cost me $1,600. Using the school's equipment, um, I used like I bought chocolate sauce for blood, and I spent 50 bucks on the titles, and everything else was just lab costs. And um, and I shot it on reversal, and and just edited the original, which is unheard of. So so it's like 1,600 dollars to make this movie, and you know I showed it at my school. I went to the San Francisco Art Institute, and almost everyone was like, "This is violent. What?" <laughs> what? Ew! You know, and I was just like, God. But there was one girl in the audience that's like, you know what? I think that this is important, and I think it's cool. And I was like, God, that's all I need to hear. And they wouldn't show my film in the student film show. They said, Oh, it's a juried show. But I was like the only student that didn't get in. So I was kind of like, All right. And luckily, I had this, I had this teacher that's really amazing. This guy named George Kishar, and he was like. Start your own film show. Fuck them. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so the girl who played my serial killer had an art space, and like I put up flyers for five days straight. Hey, dude, you smell fine. I promise. So, so like I, you know, and all of a sudden, like I think 150 people showed up for two shows. You know, that most of them, like me and Kristen, didn't know. And it was great. Like, we served cereal. My mom <laughs> came out and she bought a cake of beer before oh, nice. I started working with her on a regular basis. And, you know, it was, like, so cool. And I just started showing, like, because of that show, people were really into the movie. People really liked it. I found that, you know, the kind of people who are going to come in off the street seeing a cool flyer, that's going to be my audience, not some, like, you know, art school. So, so all of a sudden, it looked, seemed like people were interested in it, and people wanted to see it, and people were paying money to see it, and I just thought, well, you know, all these people are paying to like buy records by mail order, why can't I just do that with video? So I made a cover, I actually had a friend make it for me, I paid him like a hundred bucks, and um, I started sending out copies to review the different scenes that I like, you know, like film thread, or we got a review in the nose, a friend of mine was an intern there, and I got an order from George Carlin and the producers of Natural Born Killers before they made the movie. So that whole movie's a ripoff of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it just like kept growing and Film Threat was really huge at that time. Like it had a really big impact because all of a sudden they were like, I think just because girls didn't really talk to the guys at Film Threat a lot, so maybe I loved Dan where it's like they just needed to write about a girl, I don't know. But like they voted the film top 25 underground film you must see and they just kept plugging it you know, free, and so I kept getting all these orders, and then um, I had sent a copy to Sassy Magazine, because I loved Sassy, so <laughs> <laughs> and like, Sassy just ruled, and, um, and they wrote about it, and then I got like all these orders in, but I wasn't living off it, but it was definitely like getting out there, I was keeping records, I was keeping everyone's address that had ever bought anything from me, I was trying to be very, you know, concise, for a while it was all handwritten. And then when I graduated, I got a computer for graduation, and I started keeping everything on there. Like, Final Maker is my best friend. And um, 
And then I decided, okay, now I've had a bit of success with this film. I have somewhat of a reputation. I want to do my feature. I want to do a movie about sex. And I sent out a postcard to everyone who had ordered a copy from me and anyone I had ever met, basically, you know, that I kept in FileMaker, and was like, you send me a hundred bucks and I'll put your name in the credits. And people who I had never even met had sent me money because they really liked Zero Color. They were into what I was doing. And, um, and so based on that, and then at, in the meantime, I had done a comic, like a compilation comic book that had made its money back and had been distributed like internationally. So the girl who worked on that with me, she had gotten her car accident settlement in, and um, she gave me money and I got a grant. And so I like got twelve thousand dollars, and and um, I shot Mary Jane. And then we got nonprofit nonprofit affiliation through this totally corrupt company, and. Um, but that meant all the donations were tax deductible. And at this point I was really lucky because everything was donations. It wasn't like fundraising that I had to pay back. And um, eventually, you know, we did have to set it up that way. And people sort of started to see some of their money back, but not huge. But, um, you know, I finished my film and it played the festival circuit. It played at Sundance, it played at different places. And, it, and I could see that every time, every place it played, that there was people that would like buy t-shirts from me and buy my first film and were really into it, would sign up for my mailing list. I thought, you know, there are people that are interested out there. And after I was sort of done with the festivals, like, fuck it, I don't want to get a temp job. Let's distribute this movie. But then, you know, I had sort of a secret weapon. My mom had come out to work with me because she had just gotten divorced in Minneapolis and she was working dumb jobs there. And I was like, well, if you're going to do a dumb job, why don't you do like, my dumb job. And come out <laughs> so, so she came out, and she used to be like a top full of rush sales lady. So, you know, her, like her technique of being able to sell and being organized, and she's tough. Because you talked to my mom. Did you that you? Or, I think I did. Yeah. You know, she my mom doesn't take any shit. She was actually. She must have beat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must have caught her on a good day. So, you know, the thing is, it's like to just understand what you're worth be like you know no i'm not gonna do stuff for free you know it's like pay me and people will i mean sometimes they won't it depends on the thing if it's a really cool thing yeah whatever but it's like you know what i do i'm worth something and i think that's a really important attitude to have and i think that's something that people don't have a lot it's considered really unpumped to like want money or to be you know very on top of like, look, you know, this is something, this is something that I'm offering, and you pay money back. You know, especially like in an artist scene, especially as a girl, like you're supposed to feel like you're supposed to do everything for everyone else. You're supposed to feel like you're supposed to give everything to everyone else, and that's kind of bullshit. You especially know? when you're giving something that's not tangible, like a record. Yeah, you know, something that's like, dude, man, I should just deserve one. You know. I did the same thing with the senior book. I asked for sponsorships. Yeah. You know, so like, you send me a donation more than $25. Yeah. It's like, that is you giving money to a project that you want to support, not because you're going to get something back from it, but because you want to support it. Yeah, exactly. And then we need to kind of like get away from that idea of, well, what's it going to be? Kind of, I'll give you money, but what's it going to be? You know, I mean, one thing, I think I got a lot of support because I was just really enthusiastic about it. It's like, you know, and I pr proven to people that I had done stuff before. I wasn't like, do man, it feels like so cool. It's like, you know, I made a video, I've sold like 900 copies of it, you know, I've like done a comic book, it's gotten international distribution, you know, like I do a lot of things that do get seen, so it's like there's there's some proof there, you know, there's some, I mean, in that I learned from George Kishar. I wanted this guy in my school, I was like, oh, how can I get him to be an actor? You know, he's like the cool guy in school, I'm totally the new girl, like how am I gonna get this guy to act in my film? And George was like, why don't you show your last film and prove to people that like, you finish films and show them and then they'll be more likely to help you. And that was such, that's like the best advice I think I ever got. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. Like, if you have ideas and you actually put them out in a zine and you actually take the time to like, put it out there, even if you're not making money, in a way you're sort of proving that you can do something, you can finish it, and you, and you have the guts to show it. You know, which I think is a really huge thing. So, um, you know, luckily, I feel like the years of work I did on Serial Killer and different projects kind of led me to be able to support myself off Mary Jane. Um, oftentimes, you know, like, we'll do, we'll, I'm really aggressive with promotion, so when we're in theaters, like, we get a cut of the door like a band. You know, I'll come in and spend time and really promote, you know, really 
try to get as much press, put up flyers, you know, just like utilize any kind of grassroots method to get the word out that we're showing. Um, you know, sometimes speak at a college, which is usually okay in my transportation if someone doesn't already. And then sell tapes and t-shirts to kind of exist as I'm staying there. And like I said, I have stuff here and I'm offering a special discount on shirts normally they're 15, but for you, 15 to 10, because you're also cute. And you know, and that's sort of like at the top of it I've done it. That's great. Um, we're kind of uh, coming close to four o'clock, and Sarah's going to do a workshop about film at four o'clock. Well, I was just going to basically say all the stuff that I just said. So. Well, maybe we can. Do you want to? Do you guys feel like extending this and maybe asking questions of people, and we'll just go until five? That sounds good to me, Richard. Um, I have some practical experience in running a newsstand, and I think leaders are maybe the only people that when they say consignment, they mean you all sell it and then give me money for what, what I sold. You know, there's a, my idea of consignment, or what I have to do with everybody else is, you give me a shipment, I pay for you, that I pay for that shipment when you give it to me, and then what I don't sell, you give me credit towards the next issue. And mostly because these don't come out regularly enough. I mean, there are some of the few, but the most don't. In, order. in the bus ones, I think, are the regular. My, my point is that you should get the money first. Right. But it's kind of like... If you can. Yeah. But you should try. <coughs> the problem... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the problem is um, the mindset of, of, the way the, of the way the distributors uh, in the scene, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's their mindset that they they start off not really having, and you know, no one really has money to go out and pay for a shipment of zines, um, you know. So they wind up. So a lot of the time, people take on more than they can actually handle, and it overwhelms them. And and this is something that's really not talked about at all in the scene, like like uh, being appreciated for one's labor. And and pay, you know and paid for it like it's it's out of the question in the in the punk scene and I. But it shouldn't be. It, it should yeah it shouldn't be at all and in, in fact, if anything I mean it, it's it's very anti it's very anti labor you know um, and very unappreciative of you know people of people's work um, and I, I think I think that. It's it's almost like a it's a very big contradiction, you know, when, when you have people. But can I just throw in though that yeah. sometimes like the zines aren't going to sell and they're just going to sit there and get more and more afraid and and <coughs> then it's like, I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate and then it's like the store owner's responsibility, like they've paid out the money for stuff that's not going to sell. So I think sometimes you have to talk about issues of like how am I going to communicate with people better through zines or whatever product that I have to sell to to sell them. Yeah. You know, that's that's like I mean, with me it's sort of like I mean I started out doing a zine and sending it to other people, trying to get it distributed. So I dealt with all these shady distributors that, like they both just said, you know they have a really relaxed attitude about you know it's like I'm doing something for you, whatever you know not making any effort to to come through on their end of the thing and with any money or or anything. But now it's like here I am as a distributor. And all these other people are in in the in place of the editor, and so it's like, you know, when when Tree of Knowledge started, it was a really small thing. I sold zines locally, bought them, brought everything up front. But you know, these were all zines that didn't cost a whole lot. Like, I remember when I first started buying Fucktooth from Jen. I'd buy five or maybe ten copies, pay up front, and now it's like I'll get a shipment of like two hundred, you know. And it's like I can't afford to pay her yeah. that much money. Like here, oh thanks, you know. So we have a we have a long history of working together and this is just one example where it's like she trusts me right I hope and, and I think you know. that's kind of the strength of tree of knowledge because they are actually one of the few people that pay on time like even AK Press who's big they don't pay on time you have to nag them they owe me money from 1996 oh AK Press you yeah. know so it's kind of like I mean it's, <laughs> but it's even sense. not even AK Press like Tower the one who everybody wants to go to because they're so big and oh they'll pay on time I have never been paid correctly from that I think a lot of a lot of those large, like I've heard, I haven't dealt with like fine print or anything, but you know, you, it's not hard. They're to, out of business, right? But you don't have to go far to hear stories of people that, that feel they got screwed by them. And it's like, 
I think a lot of those sort of semi-corporate or, or like Tao, these corporate things sort of make money off the backs of smaller publishers that have no recourse when they get screwed. And, and like, I mean, if they're dealing with some huge publisher, with lawyers and all this other, and, and they sell a huge volume of these people's product, it, it, you know, they go right, they are straight with them, you know, they settle up. But with, if you deal with all these individual, you know, get the edit zines out of their bedrooms, you know, and there's a hundred or a thousand of them or whatever, it's a lot of money overall, and you know, they just, they don't pay. I just want to tell my tower story though, because like, I sold, I sold them 200 copies of Serial Killer for their video stores. I had like been working on them for a month, you know, just sort of like, oh, I have a list of people that I'll bug over the phone for what I, and they had a 1-800 number, so I'd bug them. And eventually they bought it, you know, they were like, oh, okay, we finally got the money. And I didn't get paid for the longest time, and I called the guy, I'm like, where the fuck is my money? And he goes, did you send me an invoice? And I go, oh. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know what the fucking invoice right. was, you know, so. I kind of think that consignment is necessary, though. Like, we have to deal with it because zines don't have the name recognition that bands do. So, like, a store is not going to be like, well, I'll buy this up front. I've never heard it or seen it before. Yeah, Unless they have a sample could. copy, and you can't send a sample copy to every store that exists. Or it's almost like consignment at first until you prove yourself and then demand the money because after you've proven that you can make it. I think it, I think it should work the other way around. The, that you prove you prove that you're serious about what you're doing when you're first starting out, even if it's even if it's buying three, three or copies. five three or five copies of a zine at a dollar a piece. You know, you, you, you start out you have like yeah. let's say fifty bucks, a hundred bucks. Okay, I'm gonna buy this, this, and this, and you put it together, and then you pay them on time, and you do that two or three times. When people do that with me, I, I'll I'll do consignment with them for, forever. I mean, mo the, the the distributors that I use nowadays, uh, um, they pay on time, but I, I really don't go through too many distributors. I only go through people that I know are, are reliable. And, you know, it, it's, it's just happened too many times where I've been fucked over. Like, well, one thing about Tower, though, and, and, uh, and AK Press, like, AK Press has not to this day paid me for, um, for the Carnival of Chaos books, which, which I put out. And uh, and neither ha neither is Tower, even though I have sent them invoices. So it's sometimes very hard to actually work with these with bigger d distributors, especially when you're talking about things of press. Like it's much easier with records to sell them and actually get paid than it is with print. And like the Carnival of Chaos book, like co uh, cost so much money to produce, and like I've lost like thousands and thousands of dollars putting it out. And it's an awesome book, and I love it and everything, but like it's. And I think it was totally worth doing, but like, it's really, it's really, it. Did you it's use the records to subsidize that? What's that? Mean? Yeah, the records subsidized it. The records have subsidized like other projects. Like, like I've I've put out like, like I paid for the printing of a lot of different scenes, like Infinite Onion and and, uh, and Defenestrator and whatever you know things that I think should exist, you know, with money from the label and just like, you know, just to put it out there. But like sometimes, like in the world of print, it's it's a totally different thing because because first of all, like the profit, the the you have to sell you have to sell whatever you're selling at at um at what is it sixty percent sixty percent of the book of the book cost, and then you have to take care of the not to, but to distributors you would sell for 40, 55 percent off yeah sometimes so you're talking about forty five percent what you're percent, getting yeah. So yeah, it's really not much. Yeah, so I feel like you have a two dollar zine, two dollar cover price zine or something like that, and you, you know, what, what you're, you're making like, like you know seventy cents. Yeah, and then like consider the amount of time, the, the, the amount of time you have to spend on it, the um, the amount of money you spend on phone calls or faxes or whatever, um, you know, to get them to finally pay pay you, uh, you know, and all that all that kind of stuff. So it it in in conclusion, like like, the best thing is to just keep keep a very accurate database of who is doing what with you, and like, and as much as it's wonderful to like trust everybody, like trust is something. Trust is something that people really have to earn.
And once they earn it, like, it's like, you know, great, like, we have a really strong community, but just, like, immediately having that assumption that just because we're all punks and, like, no one's going to fuck us over, you know, it's, that's like, oh. <laughs> You won't go very long with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, 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 you have a question in the back? Yes. Stand up, stand up, stand up, and project. Yeah. Stand up, come on. This is Rin, everybody. Shaka, yeah. wait. <laughs> From the diaphragm, speak. Speak. Um, we kind of lost in the detail. The numbers, the yeah, you know, the consignment, the talk, all this different. Isn't it boring? Should we explain? Yeah, should we, should we, should we explain it or? have sort of like a badly Xerox cover of a zine that like you can't really tell what it is and it doesn't say what's inside, why would I even like want to pick it up or, or, you know, like how am I supposed to know what's in that zine besides the fact that you're really cool and you made it? You know what I mean? You have to kind of like learn to ex extend, I mean, I put a lot of creativity into, into my marketing. It's like I try to make sure that my posters are really, really cool, you know, that people like are going to look at it and be like, wow, okay, it was in Sundance, Jello Biafra's in it, this cool music, and you know, it seems to be about sex. Like, those are things that are gonna make me like come to this movie. You know, and it doesn't have to be, like you're not fooling anyone, you're not being like unethical. It, to me, it's like being really, like being able to communicate what's going on, because you can't, you know, you can have art on a wall and just like take it in all in one minute, but like you have to open up and read a zine, or you have to like project a movie, you know, you can't just like 
experience it all at once. Same with music, you know, if you're like looking at it, so you really need to be able to communicate beyond that, like, to understand. And sometimes you, you do have to be a little bit reductive to do it, you know. I mean, sex always works. Tits <laughs> work, sorry. It's, you know. I think uh, the other issue is like, with especially with benzene, I mean, and all the products that we buy, it's like we're willing to pay fourteen dollars for a CD, but we two dollars more than two dollars for a zine is a no-no. <laughs> and I mean, I find that really frustrating because it's like, I mean, if you look at Theo and I, we both have zines that have been around for a long time. They're well established, and it's like I am scared to death to charge more than two dollars for my zine because I think they won't sell. You know, and it's like we're doing my zine is like it's a hundred pages. That's big. That costs a lot of money. You know, but I won't charge three dollars because I have so many people. I mean, well, we're doing a split thing, and we're going to charge three dollars for it. But my like <laughs> own personal issue, you know, because then we have to, you know, the fifty cents we make off it, we have to split between two people, you know. But it's, it's like go back into advertising, anyway. right? You know, so but it's like it's kind of like people are so wedded to the idea that it can only it it kind of is very telltale sign about how people value. You know, and it's like, well, the Zine yearbook, okay, it's six dollars. You know, and it's a book, and you think, well, books can cost more than six dollars, but the people who buy are Zine people, and Zine people are used to paying two dollars. You know, so it's like, okay, well, it costs this much money to make, but I'm scared to s do that, and I don't think it's a. I mean, in some ways, it's a marketing issue, but in some ways, there's only so much you can do because, like, I had definitely have repeat customers. You know, it, who and there's definitely a demand for it. You know, but it's like I think there's kind of a, also a saturation issue. You know, it's like everyone's like, oh, fuck tooth is so successful. It's like I only make 1,500 copies. That's how many I make. You know, it's like I don't know if I could sell more, especially if I was targeting. <coughs> so I think part of it is also people being creative with marketing, as well as changing the attitudes of consumers to say that your dollar shows how much you value that product. You know, and it's like, this is worth $3. You know, I think these are worth $3. I pay more for things that I enjoy. You know, but it's a matter of changing people's, finding a way. It's like, I don't really know how to do that. It's like, how do you find a way to convince people that it's okay to pay? Sure. I think it did that. Like, I just paid, you know, I just paid $6 for Motor Booty over there. And I would, because that is consistently like a really, and it always right, has stuff in it. Right, because you look at it's like cover yeah. to cover, yeah. you know, offset printed. They probably make like 4,000 copies. But also, it's thing. funny as hell, and it's always really interesting. Like, I know that it's not going to sit on a shelf and be unread. Like, I'm always going to read it, and it's always going to be really good. Back to answer what, oh, mm -hmm. like real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Like, about what, what Ren asked was like, uh, when is it, you're, I mean, when you're asking kind of when does it go from being passion or a hobby to sort of becoming a job? Is that kind of what you're at a vocation? Well, I mean, I think a lot of that question is how much time do you put into it? I mean, there's been days when I've, you know, I'll spend 12 hours a day working on tree of knowledge or more. And it's like, when you're spending that much time doing something, and then that limits how much time, hours yeah, it's job like, after that. Right, I mean, it becomes a question of how much of your life becomes this, part of this entity and I mean, are you willing? Because I mean, yeah, it's like if you're not making a living at it, it's not. If that's not like it's not my vocation. It's something I put in time when I could be doing something else, and because I really care about it, you know, I really care about the alternative media and, and seizing control from corporations. I think that's really one of the most fundamentally important and necessary things we can do as individuals, and that's kind of the. And, you know, Mary and I have talked about this, and we both feel that that is something that we care enough to do to put in, you know, these eight-hour days on that. But at the same time, it's like, if you're not making money doing that, you know, you can't tell the bill collector or whatever. I mean, you got to pay your rent. you got to pay your bills. you got to eat. And, you know, there's just sort of limits to it all. There's also an issue. Are you keep trying to say yeah, something? Yeah, let's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, just, maybe we need to be mediated, not... Yeah. Okay. Well, well, do your job. Yeah, um, well, Steve. Shut up and let him talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um... Well, a lot of people who buy zines, you, you also have to consider their their income bracket. You know, a lot of, a lot of kids, you know, like, they either work 
crap jobs that you know where they're making minimum wage or their students. But where they, they can they have afford $14 CDs every day. Yeah, and new yeah. tattoos. Or you have seven and inches. Seven inches. Songs. <laughs> yeah, but $14 tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I mean, but the, I mean, those. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I not to cut you off. Yeah, I hear. Well, okay. Yeah. So I wanted yeah. to say, but sometimes when your passion becomes your job, like your job is always going to kind of suck. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's like. If you're like, okay, I'm going to make money off my zine, that means I have to adhere to a strict schedule where I come out with a new zine every two months, no matter how much it kills me. And, you know, I think we've all seen zines with once they really start to get regular, like, they suck because it's not the passion that's in it. Or sometimes it's like, okay, now I absolutely have to be supporting other people and I have to be bringing in money. And, and you know, there's a toughness that goes along with that. And there's, like, sort of a, no, a non-funness that goes along with that because you you have to be like fairly professional and fairly mature about it. <coughs> yeah, definitely. You know, so so it's kind of a mixed bag. It's like, do you really want your passion to be your job? You know, sometimes you don't because sometimes it's more fun when it's just a passion. You know. Okay. I, I guess I I forgot my point in, in the last thing I was saying. Uh, Speak up. Oh, the the right, and the last thing that I was saying actually like I think one of the big bigger problems that's kind of come up in the in the zine world are these all advertising zines that provi provide these like really thick glossy covered or like newsprint magazines that are just like basically like the same crappy interviews with like Braid or the Get Up Kids or what, whatever other <laughs> like garbage is popular right now and um and it's just like all advertising, and it's totally driven by advertising and like by music and and by the, this music thing, and and it winds up it really eclipsing the better zines, you know, because because you know where people actually put in writing, you know, a lot of like time writing it or doing artwork, you know, that winds up being you know xeroxed and like you know thirty pages or something like that, and it ta and and it takes these people you know a couple months you know months to do to do these things. And then they feel funny about charging two dollars for it, while they, like these big kind of glossy zines will, you know, charge two dollars. You know, you know, they'll charge two dollars for their thing, and like, you know, and they're, they're so like, much in advertising, though. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like Nitro Records or like Revelation or Relapse or whomever, Epitaph. Epitaph <laughs> they like shovel money at, you know, shovel money at yeah. this specific element of the zine world, like only, only this like vapid music zine thing and it winds up it, like uh, people aren't really able to differ i don't know people don't really differentiate so much in, it, at least in terms of my perception like between like you know the different types of zines that there actually are you know that that one is like really a piece of art and a labor of love and the other one's just like you know practice to w go on to the advertising agency no, I totally disagree. Totally I think there's really awesome zines that do have advertising, and I think there's like really different zines. Mm -hmm. Like I know one of the guys that's in my film, he does a zine called Ain't Nothing Like My Fucking Moonshine, and this is not like, you know, your music scene. It's really weird, and like, you know, sometimes for me it's so hard because it's all handwritten and weird and fucked up drawings, and like, mm -hmm. for him, it's so, it's so, it was so amazing when like Matador came through and like started buying ads and it really did help them. So I mean, that's different that's, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I think, you know, I don't think you can do like all like ads all bad. I mean and part of it I'm playing devil's advocate too. Oh, no, I, mean, well, I, I, I don't think that's what he's saying. I'm yeah. just saying he's just saying like so it's like I have I have advertising. Yeah. It's like yeah. the advertising is the main part of the thing. Well I guess yeah. I don't see things like that. Yeah, yeah. well I, no, I was gonna say I think part of it is like the attitude of like the advertisers and also the attitude of you accepting advertising for your zine. Um, there's like four ads in my zine and there weren't ones that I got, um, they got money for. It was my boyfriend um, who I said like, oh, like, you know, let's trade ads for, you know, our projects and that was okay. And um, Pat Malley who had really just been helping me out a lot and I said, you know, you've done so much for me you know, I'll give you three inches for yo-yo, um, you know, because that was like a favor of a friend. 
and like there's an edit from Epitaph that's like you can barely read it and it's because I don't like them and um, <laughs> like I just had like this big thing with Epitaph where it's not that ad but it was that um, after they sent me that ad I wrote to them I'm like these aren't my ad rates anymore this isn't this this isn't that you know and um, they sent me another ad with a bigger check and I just sent it back to them and I was like you know what like you're just wasting your time and money um, you know like you're wasting my space because the people who read my zine aren't interested in Epitaph and you're wasting your money because you're not like reaching your market or whatever and that's totally how advertisers have to see your zine so it's like if you present it that way like you know having interviews with like these ten bands um, and everything that you do with the zine yeah, you know, like interviewing bands and stuff like you have to admit that like you're like promoting and marketing these so if you put like a picture of a band in your zine or a band interview but you're not like like promoting like reviewing zines or like interviewing zine publishers it's like that's one way that you could really be like supporting other <coughs> zine people um, that I just don't see happening a lot I don't know where I'm going with this but like um. One yeah. thing I want to mention is I'm doing a workshop tomorrow which is about advertising. So some of these topics can be covered then as well. And then um, I don't know if we want to move on. Cause we is there any other questions? Mary, Mary has something. I'm just, just going to talk more about like Rin's question about when does a passion become a vocation. And one of the things I've noticed is that in like the punk scene or the DIY scene in general, um, when things that start out small like distros, whether they're records or zines or even bands, um, you know, and it starts to consume more and more of your time. And uh, the people that have been successful enough to make money off of it and have a distro that supports them and pays their bills and supports itself, uh, it seems like, you know, they're putting in like 80 hours a week. Whereas when we talk about work in general and the ideal work situation and making yourself happy by doing whatever it is that makes you happy, ideally most people want to work like, you know, 30 hours a week or so. But it's like, like people, I know Theo, like a year and a half ago, or two years ago, he raised a lot of the cover prices in order for Tree Knowledge to support itself. Well, I raised things to the cover price. To the cover price, because we were selling things in. Yeah, but. And uh, people come up to us and they're like, "Your prices are too high. You guys are like capitalist fuckers because <laughs> you guys try to get money off of this." And it's how dare you not give it away yeah. for free? Yeah. And it's yeah. completely yeah. ridiculous, you know, that we have these standards for like, I oh, well, <laughs> working sucks, and I only want to work like 20 hours a week and be able to have all this time to like hang out and go to shows and stuff but then when people do things like the distros and the zines and the bands they put so much more effort into it and then they're fuckers I've noticed that uh, there seems to be this division between people who do zines and people who just sort of read zines and don't really uh, have projects of their own it seems like most of the people I know who do zines don't really like the uh, music domination of the zine world. It seems like every, no one really seems to like the music zines as much, but, but it seems to me that uh, those are the most popular zines. Who's it buying seems like, Yeah, they're, I mean, someone's buying all of them. And I'm just wondering if you guys saw that same sort of division when you thought if anything could be done about it or what, you know, what can we do with I think partly it's, um, sorry to jump in here. Partly it's because people are frustrated about the reliance on the music industry for money. You know, it's like that's where the dollars are. And it's kind of like, I think people are resentful that that's where you have to go if you want. It's not necessarily where you have to go, but it's like the easiest route to go to get the money. It's like, I don't do band interviews, but I have bands, like, label advertising, but that's only because I have been doing my zine for so long, I used to do band reviews and I have a good relationship with those advertisers. You know, so it's kind of like, I think that, in a way, it's kind of looked at as an easy out. But then at the same time, you can look at some of the music zines out there that are really well done and really, really good. You know, like 10 Things from Seattle is a fantastic zine, you know, and it's like, well, I can disagree with that, but, you know, <laughs> but it's kind of like, you need to... I just think that it's easier to do a music scene and be successful at it without It's interested me, it's like, had this big clump of money, like he, you know, he got like, what was it, it was like a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to, to do vermiform, and he did vermiform, he basically like shoveled all his money into like,
putting Rorschach on tour and Citizens Arrest and Born Against and whomever and just had everybody tour around, you know, all of his friends and bought them vans and and yeah, he inherited the money. He inherited the money and like totally squandered it. And <laughs> like he pissed it away. Like it, like it shows. It was so funny because we I would go to a Born Against show and he would sell Born Against seven inches for a quarter. Like and like and if you were doing distro, if you were doing distro, he's like, oh okay, I wholesale them. At, I wholesale them at three dollars a piece or something like like something ridiculous. Like you could buy individual copies for a quarter. And and it was just like so funny how he was like fucking with fucking with people's perceptions at that time. And it was like totally brilliant and it needed to happen because like this was in the era when like Revelation Records was like like really, you know, like th this big like, it was already starting to become this like big entity and like the whole like hardcore scene and like, you know, this big money maker and everyone just wanted to like fuck with all that. And, and over time, you know, like I don't know. There was like there were like big debates between like Charles Maggio, Charles Maggio, and and, and Sam McFeeters, when like Sam is like, look, you know, I spent all of my money and I have like no money to do Vermiform, so I'm considering going to Dutch East India. And Dutch East India is this like distribution company that offered him a press and distribute deal. What's your point? And wait, the point? No, wait. Let's, okay, wait. Because you're naming names and. I know. Okay. Well, okay, let me get. Okay. Let me get. Like Okay, ba basically, so basically, a lot of these people who started this whole ethic have like you have to look at the history of what happened to them and when all this stuff when all this started. Like, why do we pay? Why do we pay? We have to question why things are the price that they are because people just en you know when they enter into the scene they see that the prices are a certain way and like people have to start kind of questioning that and wondering you know why. You know, I, I guess that's that's really my point that that. Um, that a lot of a lot of why we're doing things the way that we're doing them is based on stuff that was done ten years ago. That's very very out of date. Okay, that's yeah. my I point. mean, I think also like just a problem with a punk scene in general, or it, it goes into political scenes as well. Is like a lot of it's based on guilt and shame. You know what I mean? It's like you're not good enough. You have to be ashamed of yourself. Like I feel like all the time people are so guilty all the time in a punk scene. It gets so boring. It's like, God, just get the fuck over it. And, um, you know, to have, to try to really build up a confidence where it's like, I'm doing these things for a reason, you know, and it works both ways because you get a lot of people that, that act on like, sell out, you sold out, you didn't sell out, this, that, like naming, labeling, all this crap, you know, because it's like, look, no one's gonna ever like, go up to Madonna and be like, man, Madonna, you sold out. Because she's, just, <laughs> she's like, kind of been like um, established yourself as a certain thing yet you know you have a punk band that's not going to make like one thousandth of what she makes and it, you know if they move in a certain direction and you don't understand why they're, it's going to be solid 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 and I think like what I'd look, really like to see is a move away from like like shame based punk rock yeah. you know yeah. or just the fact that money alone is what's is, is what we have to avoid. Yeah. The, I mean, the thing that I want to see being avoided is, you know, entities with money taking advantage of, uh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here, but I, I just see entities with money that aren't, that don't have the integrity and the thoughtfulness and, and just the idea base that a lot of these indie people do. And yet, well, exactly. Like, how do we get resources into this pool, this super creative, energetic pool of uh, talent? And um, like, why why is it so hard for like? Cause we do feel bad if we make money with our thing because we have this idea that only because now the ones that make money seem to be the ones that aren't really what's the word I want. They cool. aren't. They aren't cool. They aren't. Okay. They're, they're, they're fucking sellers. Yeah. Crap. <laughs> but that it's not just because they make money. That's not the reason they they suck. Well, they have to be more serious. But it's a different level. Right. Exactly. You know, you can't be all like, oh, it's so groovy. Man, everyone's my friend. You know? So, how can there be good things that make money, or how can <laughs> how can we make good things that make money? Let's okay. Well, let's start here. Um, but I think. A, I don't think Madonna ever attached a set of politics to her 
Well, no, I mean, I would just say it is, but I mean, publicly in that way. I said politics specifically. No, I'm just saying that yeah. people, people will never attack people who are just like assumed Already to there. be bad. Yeah. I mean, and I actually think Madonna's awesome, yeah. so this may be a bad example, but you know what I mean? Like, no one's going to bother to say, man, answer me. Their politics are really fucked up, you know? No one's ever going to, like, really give them a hard time, whereas if, like, a zine that... I just think that people who try to do the right thing all the time get a lot more shit than people who just don't care and are very open about it. And that's like a mindset of thinking that it's like, why don't we be more critical, of, you know, like stop being critical of people. Like Fact Sheet 5, how many people here have ever just Fact Sheet 5 and given them a hard time? And what they do is like so instrumental. I mean, they're not even around anymore because it's like, how could they take that kind of criticism yet? You know, you don't, you don't apply that same kind of critical, that criticism to, you know, like a company that's just based for profit. You know what I mean? It's like, why are you treating like the systems that are in place that are actually better for the community, like worse than you would for someone who's purely based on profit. And that's just the point I wanted to throw out. Did you have another question? I, I think it all also ties back into I guess, the point about the avocation versus vocation and the question of whether basically the labor you put into something is a labor that you you donate to that project which is something you love. And I think that I mean all of you on the panel are people who have through your talents and skills at least pushed in some way towards that different vocation. That this thing that you love, you still have that passion, you still have that love, and yet you do it very successfully. Um, and I think that there's lots of people out there who do zines or any kind of underground media um, who may or may not want um, for your vocation. So I mean, your point was great that you know, when you have to do it every month or whatever, it doesn't talk quite as fun anymore. Um, and so that, I, think that, I think that is a split. That there's a split, I mean, in the zine world, in the music world between we do this thing and we're going to put it out there in some way and we aren't interested in getting paid for our labors. We may get it interested, maybe interested in getting paid for our materials and not the labor. And the split side, which is what you're saying here, which is where, hey, my labor's worth something and other people seem to value that as well. Um, and I think that's just a sort of distinction and that different people are going to fall on different sides of that um, and maybe neither one is really right or wrong. There's a hand back here. I was just going to say, I don't think it's an issue about who makes money and who doesn't. It's just, if it's going to it's gonna become something that, uh, I mean, if it's an issue of greed and wealth and what you end up doing with your money, people can make money on whatever it is, if it's a zine selling or music or seven inches or whatever. It's just what that money ends up going back into. Like, if you get it from hard work or by chance, like, for and against out of that and what they ended up doing with all that money, I mean, if you get thousands and thousands upon of dollars for what you do, as long as it's going to go back into that and get more stuff out and provide more distribution and stuff like that. I don't think oh, that's yeah, issue. I would, I would comment a lot, but like, I'd like to comment about that because I think Bill Biafra made a really good point when he said, you know, you look at someone like Green Day and they've made so much money and they turn around and they do put it back into projects. Like, they put a lot of money into food, not bombs. And, you know, I remember when Kurt Cobain got really, really big and everyone's like, oh, he just you know, whatever went on his own thing, and it just seemed like once he got really big, and maybe I don't know the particulars, but like a lot of people turned their back on him and was just like, man, fuck off, like corporate sellout, whatever, and kind of, I feel, it feels like a lot of people abandoned him, and then he was like really vulnerable to a lot of people who maybe, whose motives weren't, you know, as true, and I think, I mean, the point of what I'm saying is, Jello was saying like, instead of being bitter towards people who, who are able to get to a level of success that maybe not everyone has, to keep them in the community because, mm, because they'll not only for your either. community to be able to bring that stuff in, but also for those people because yeah. it's like all of a sudden, they still I just, need I just think that like, you know, also punk tends to be very cannibalistic where it's like, eat your own really fast. And that, yeah. what kind of community response is that? I mean, it should include like all levels. Like, it's for me. Bryn, come back. Bryn. What? Bryn. Speak. I'm saying something because someone else has a question. So we guys should arm us <laughs> uh, I wanted to respond to you. Yeah, I really appreciate your comment. Sarah. Yeah, yeah. 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 She brings up Miss Jason. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to get to the bottom of the
is kind of a uh, well, we're setting each other up for failure. Place the glass ceiling on before we even start. Perfect example, we just attended the Connie DeFranco concert last night. We did that 10 years ago, we're in the know. We do it now, we're sellouts. There's something wrong with this, you know. You're a sellout if you have any of the concert? same discussion we've been having. We had the same discussion from the first meeting of Planning Bumps 3 to today. It's been in every conversation of what is selling out and what is not. This is my question. So maybe the problem is not something outside of us, which all of us are willing to admit because we're all angry at something. And music, uh, visual arts, uh, those answers have all expressed some sort of anger and culture. You've talked about book business and stuff like that. Maybe this. Oh, yeah. Maybe there's some problems within the community. Maybe we're placing too much faith in our market, or the, the groups that are buying our things. Or maybe we're just paying too much attention to the people who use the word sellout a lot. Maybe we should know. <laughs> 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 you, you, should we stop paying attention to you? Exactly. <laughs> I apply for that. I think part of it is you know, knowing what parts so of it. Just like the, the, uh, Sorry. the panelists, they can talk about that philosophy. I think sometimes it's hard to be confident. It's really something you have to learn, you have to practice. You know, if, if you sort of act like, look, this is how it should be, a lot of times you'll get that back. I mean, a lot of times you won't, a lot of times you yeah, ask fuck off. But, you know, I mean, you, and I think sometimes it's important to start small with things, you know, I mean, it's just like, God, I couldn't go in and be like, I'm going to direct my first feature just right off the bat. It's like, I feel like I had to do a lot of th small things first. And I think that's really important, especially when I made I Was a Teenage Serial Killer, and people actually liked it, responded to it. It just made me feel like I could do anything. It was amazing. You know, but I had done a lot of stuff that hadn't been as popular, hadn't been successful, but I don't know. I think that's the key of just <laughs> learning to be confident in what you do and sort of looking, always looking at out at other people to the role models of like what do I want? Who's the core people who are doing what I want and how can I learn from that? Even if I don't get to meet them or ask them questions, like how can I always do this, you know, where it's like, all right, feminism is not like a big seller of, of movies like in, in you know in the mainstream, but it's like who are people who are getting away with this? Who are people who are like making things happen. Like, I'm totally inspired by 10 Things I Hate About You, which I think is, like, one of the most feminist films I've ever seen, including, like, the last three years of indie films. You know, so, like, just learning from your environment and, you know, and sort of becoming confident. Does that make sense? Actually, I think show. part of it is um, going away from talking about, okay, I don't, basically my answer is I don't care who's a sellout. I really can care less. Like, I don't care about Green Day. Like, whatever they want to do, that's their choice, they can do it. And I'm going to spend my time supporting things that I think are worth supporting instead of talking about the things that I think are bad, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's like, okay, we talked about how much we disagree with what Green Day's doing, but why don't we talk about, well, this band that I really like, you know, I'm going to support them and put my effort into doing that instead of my effort into something that's more destructive, you know, being kind of positive in that Someone. I have no. I, one thing that. <laughs> All right, sorry. We will get to you. Okay. No, we won't. You're screwed. <laughs> 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 well, one thing I've just been feeling a lot on my travels recently is it seems like, and it seems like it's almost even going on here, that people are talking about community and they're talking about people who um, share a common interest as being community. like. This is our community because we, we're all interested in zines and punk rock or whatever. Um, and I've also just been talking to a lot of people where that's not, like maybe that's not what community is. Like community to me is more about like who is like, who lives near you and who do you share with? Because like our punk rock community may be satisfying our need for entertainment and some of our need for information, but like, you know, it's not satisfying like my need for like food and shelter, for example. Um, and that there's a lot of like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of like, let's make fun of the hippies. And I've even felt it this week, like last night going to this warehouse space collective, you know, like let's make fun of the hippies and the ravers, you know, and it's like, there's other things that are going on where maybe we need to expand our definition of community a little more to be like, we can get help from like 
a local printer who may not be pumps with presses, but this is like a local small business that I can support. And just looking, I just feel like the definition of community that's been used today has been really um, connected to like entertainment and that maybe if we expanded it a little more to like food co-ops and other things that we need to be supporting, that we could see that there's a lot more help and there's money <coughs> that's circulating there that we could, you know, get jobs in or help you know, support that needs to be a lot more tighter and that some of these problems wouldn't seem so insurmountable if we saw that there is support and it's not people who are just like us. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you ask about our ethic. And I think, you know, I think each of us has, has our own, I mean, to a large degree. I mean, I have very concrete and solid anti-corporate leanings. I mean, I, I want to build an alternative to corporate control. I'm, I'm frightened by consolidation in the hands of these corporations or whatever in the, in the media, which is why I'm here. I mean, I think that probably, at least to some degree, will hit everyone in this room. Mm -hmm. I mean, why else would we... I mean, the media, the, the corporation doesn't give a shit about what I feel or what I believe. I mean, that's why I do my own thing, you know? And... I mean, it's an ethic that I think is really important. It, I would hope that it manifested itself in, in what I do, be a tree of knowledge or spectacle or my other real job, which is conservation biology. I mean, you know, it's totally different, but still, I mean, I just Why would your like your day it. job is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, it's, I mean, I, I think that it, it's something that's very central to what I do a tree of knowledge and what Mary can say her own piece on that but I mean I, I, I just don't want it to feel like it's not a big concern or whatever it's just not that anybody else really made it sound that way but I think that there is we can be financially viable or successful even and so I mean look at discord records or something I mean you know these two years ago Ian McKay was here and spoke at length about about how could something be as successful as that but still be based on some sort of ethical consumption if whether or not you believe that's an oxymoron or not. Yeah, because they're not greedy. They, they, they make sure to charge enough to cover their costs and their time and their effort, but they don't right. go what's, overboard. What's wrong with that? Yeah, there's also, no you look at he, he, the UK, though, and he, he was working like... I mean, he was in a band since when he was like 13. Yeah. You know, so that's a lot of time put lot in, of time in that pays off later. So I really do want to get to this guy. <laughs> I think part of the thing everybody forgets to mention is what are you willing to trade off of what it is a true labor of love to? Mm -hmm. I can speak as an example from my own experience about five years ago when one of the few people has been a consistent advertiser or a casino. And I do it every other month for the past nearly seven years. <coughs> Came up wow. with an offer that he wanted to you know, pretty much kind of like take me under his wing. Now, and, yeah, okay. Uh, should I start back from where I was? Or? Yeah, I'll just okay. speak up. And the thing is, what happened with it was, you know, if it was a no situation to help start another magazine, it would have been great, but it just wasn't right for TTWN. I mean, it's right for the zine I do because, you know, this is coming from a certain underground perspective, not necessarily totally punk rock, but, you know, like covering things that, you know, if I had to become more mainstream and worry about about defending advertisers I couldn't do. However, if it had been the offer you know, to help start something else, I probably would have gone for it because it'd be a totally different entity. I think it's important to realize that, you know, okay, what can you do ethically versus survival? And that's always a tough road to hoe, especially, especially since most of us have to work day jobs. But you know, the whole thing is, is, what do we do if you get an offer to do something different within that culture where you can keep your integrity? Do you go for that? Or, just sit on the side while I yell, like, sell out, sell out, or <laughs> when, and personally, I think, you know, if you, it's better to, you know, if it's an offer, if it's something that you too much of a labor of love to give up, don't do that, but if it's offered maybe something on the side where you realize, okay, I can get in here on the ground floor, and do some, make it somewhat fairly ethical, more than it probably would be, then I say go for it. It's like, it's all certain. Oh, case by case. Yeah, exactly. I think a, a main kind of philosophy, Donnie's philosophy to me that kind of applies here is that Every person who participates in zines and in the zine community and the punk community needs to decide for themselves what they want out of it and how they want it to be. And then you need to do that. Okay. You need to like 
I didn't say it. But, right, that's fine, you know. But I mean, I'm just talking about the things you're producing. I'm talking about shaping the community and stuff. You need to decide what you want out of it, and then you need to lead by example. You need to live your philosophy. It's like, well, Theo lives his philosophy by his day job. Try to. You know, and the things that he does with his spare time. And it's like, that, I think, is the best thing that anybody can do to strengthen the lean community or the punk community or whatever, is to first make up their minds you know, not be wishy-washy about what you want, and then have to have some direction, and then do that direction. And other people will see that, and that will affect the community. Does, what time is it getting? We got so. 15 minutes. Ago. Well, um, I actually do want to wrap this up. Um, this is what about a, Scott? What about him? Look at those ears. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe take the ears off. <laughs> Let me. Um, yeah, we'll to I, I, wanted, I wanted to bring something up. Okay. Um, I, I, guess, I guess the issue to me isn't so much isn't so much the the issue of the money being in the scene. It's more like what's done with it. Um, and one thing that we haven't really addressed in this circle, and that people unfortunately haven't addressed, but should start addressing, is the need to uh, to have non-hierarchical collective efforts um, within the within the scene, especially when projects become really big, and and when there's a lot more money, and you know, and when when we actually have to move to the next level, when it's not just like a, a, a sole proprietorship or one person doing it, like what I'm doing. If it ever moved to the next level, one of the things for sure that I would do is uh, is attempt to create some type of co-op uh, co or collective. Um, uh, so that you keep you keep all the interested parties involved, involved uh, actually involved in it in the decision making process in the decision making processes. And one of the problems that I actually have with corporations, the mega corporations, is that, that they're hierarchically run, which I which I, I think is is ridiculous. And it's not it's not so much that they have money; it's the fact that they are. It's well. The fact that they're hierarchical, among with, uh, among other things, that allows them to act very irresponsibly with regards to the environment, with regards to social issues like labor practices, because you have these people at the top and people at the bottom, and, and the people at the top are making these decisions based on based on a lack of a lack of information. Well, so, and what's going to make yeah. them more money? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, market research. Yeah, and and so you know that that's that's something that that. I don't know. I, I think it's very important to start to start addressing and and like realize that realize that like when we start moving to the next step, that's that should be like a very 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 big concern of ours. Otherwise, it's going to become corrupted. Like you know, like for the most part, Discord, it it is a co-op. It is a collective. You know, you, you know, you have uh, all interested parties. You know, um, making decisions democratically about what's going to go on with their records and and uh, where it's going to go and that's that's wonderful you know they they've kept prices they've kept prices low or they've done whatever they've done but only because they only because they really can see fully what's going on with it uh, you know. um, I, we do have to wrap up um, and I want to make a few announcements I, and I also I really thank all of you uh, the panel especially which I'm Don't create this hierarchy. <laughs> um, we just applauded her, and now she's dissing me. <laughs> right. um, I, I do hope this discussion keeps going on throughout the weekend, because I, I think it's they're really important questions, and I want to see us as a creative community do well for ourselves and affect the world around us, because I think it'll look better if we do. All right. Um, <coughs> the first, well, the first thing I want to say is tonight at seven o'clock we're going to break for dinner. Like, uh, go wherever you can find free food, scam it out of seltzer. garbage. Yeah, we need seltzer. <laughs> yeah. right. and and we do need seltzer. For, yeah. Yeah. Um, tonight at seven o'clock, I hope all of you return. Um, where do for, we go? Where do you come here? I'm sorry. Where do we go? Yeah, right here. Mary Jane's not a virgin anymore. Yeah. Um, we'll show here. It's a five dollar admission, and uh, she's a businesswoman. We gotta pay for the stuff. 
Um, but I think it's, uh, it's it's 96 minutes. It's a coming of age story of a young teenage girl who works in an art house movie theater with hipsters and punks and learns about life, love, and sex, especially sex. And if you get offended by sex scenes, don't come. You know, it's fairly it's fairly adult. It's racy. It's racy. Yeah, there's some racy elements in it. There's some language. So don't break, you know. So you're saying you want to spin the bottle afterwards? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it'll lead to even better. And I'll be around and I'll answer any questions that you have about the film. So. Um, also, uh, if you're if you've got a table and you don't want to totally load it all in your car, you want to kind of keep it here overnight. If you're still planning to have a table tomorrow, you can keep yourself keep your stuff in room 147, which is down the hall and across from the men's room. And they're going to lock that room. And so if we put our stuff in there tonight, then we are told that no one will. Including authorities? Including, well, the authorities might confiscate it. We're told that everything will be safe in there. Um, I don't think we can guarantee it, but um, that's what we're told. Uh, if you want to come to the conference tomorrow, we hope everyone comes back. If there's no charge, you can come back and not pay $5. Uh, yeah, so it's like. Bring salsa. Those who think we're not here, we're actually across the hall in three rooms. Um, the zine that uh, hopefully most of you contributed, I, I didn't see much activity going on back here, but um, if, if you did get a page into the zine or if you just want a copy of our memorial zine, it will be available for sale tomorrow. And if you're not here to get it, you can contact the Pippolata Delicatessa, which will be carrying it. Uh,